That's really cool. Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, the internet's also soon going to listen in. And just to give you an outline of the other uh, topics that we want to discuss today. So um, relatively recently, uh, I landed the PR to um, opt into a specific behavior for unhandled rejections in Northcore. No, no screaming, come on. This was like years of work, years. Okay. Um, you have three different modes that you can choose of none, which means like uh, all warnings are gone, everything works as in the browser pretty much, and then you have warn, which is um, pretty much the same as the default. Uh, and right now, uh, you will get a warning in case of an unhandled rejection, but you do not get a deprecation warning. And then there's the strict mode, which results in throwing an error instead of rejecting something in case of an unhandled rejection which should normally cause the process to crash in case you don't have an uncaught exception happening. Now, uh, the thing is, we last time on the last summit, we discussed that um, uh, we would only want to implement that and later on decide on what should be the default in Node Core. So now we are at the state to discuss what should be the default. And uh, for that, I don't think it's actually our duty to really do that um, and instead let our users decide on that and that's why I would like to do a survey and um, we are going to have the opportunity to gather uh, some questions from you uh, about it and, and to provide the necessary information to actually then do the survey. It should of course be unbiased, try to explain a couple of things, have examples and so on. Yeah. Then uh, we have our multiple resource hook, which is great, but it doesn't work as we had hoped for. Um, the problem is that I promise all, I, I, like who's familiar with the unhandled rejection hook? All right, that's pretty much everyone, that's good. Um, and uh, so the problem there is if you have dot race or dot all, it would also end up in there. And that's not cool because especially with race, you do not care if it resolves more than once and it, and it uses the underlying promise constructor, which then end up, ends up in the, in the multiple resource. And uh, we do not have the information to change that right now. So this is an ongoing discussion with the VA team a little bit. Um, and there are pretty much two solutions. Uh, to either have um, extra type that could be implemented to know where the multiple resource is coming from. It's a tricky part, it's not easy to determine, or it is just not logging it for a promise all, uh, promise um, all settled, and promise race, and all the built-in functions that potentially come up. Mm. And as the last point, we um, discussed that to lock unresolved promises on exit, because it normally means, like we, we get often issues on the Node.js issue tracker that, hey, I run my code and uh, now um, I actually thought the promise would keep my process alive, but my process exited. What it means is that there was no IO or anything going on anymore in the application and the event loop just ended. So that means the promise actually never resolved because otherwise there would probably be some work afterwards. And, and therefore we can warn the user about it and tell these promises at these lines never resolved, you should have a look at them. Um, yeah, so that's the overview. Do you want to continue? So promise APIs are both, I think, um, very complicated, but also somewhat on rails. Um, it, mostly in the sense that like we're going through, we have APIs that are already defined. So like for the most part, we're not going through and like by checking on like what new API should be. We're not like, at least the pattern that we've done right now is we're not like recreating all the APIs from first principles and rethinking them. 
We're taking something that already had a callback interface and giving it a promise interface and, and generally trying to do something that's a little bit better than the status quo. So like, if you think about what we had in the past, and I think a good example would be like, what happened with FS is like, first off, there were no promise implementations at all. Then you tell Promisefy, thank you, Anna. I think that was you, all right? You tell Promisefy is a really great utility. Um, and then just chime in when I get this wrong, if I do. Um, it allows you to take a callback-based API in Node and turn it into a promise returning API, but it uses underlying V8 mechanisms to create that promise. No, so, no? Uh, it used to do this, and I think at some point Google said, like, made it use the promise constructor. What? The, the, the you tell Promisify used to do the native uh, V8 oh, API. Yeah, oh, so never mind. You, thank you for correcting me when I was wrong. <laughs> so, does it not have the performance benefits anymore, or? Yeah, and so actually, um, doing that on uh, the C++ layer prevented uh, the VA team from optimizing the promise constructor more in this case, because the C++ layer couldn't be optimized. And, and having regular code could be optimized further. At least that's what Benedict told me at some point. And Young might, who's not looking or listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It should be pretty fast. Okay. And when I did the performance comparison, it was, I think, on par. Cool. So that evolved. Um, but then, like, going, yes? I have, I, really, really um, uh, I have a random question on what you just said, said about um, performance. I'm, I'm curious if you're benchmarking on different, um, like, uh, hardware, like, devices, like ARM versus, like, you know, like, I'm, I'm curious, like, if those benchmarks come into play, uh, like, like the the device device um, matrix comes into play with your benchmarking. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, we have a CI system where we can pretty much test any uh, system that we test on, but I believe it's only configured for a single system. I'm not sure, and uh, I run my benchmarks locally on a, an Intel CPU, and uh, so we do not do cross-platform benchmarks, which is mostly not a huge issue as far as I can tell. Um, it's like when we did the the, the, the benchmarks that VA based their benchmarks on eventually. Oh, sorry, it's a recorded thing. Uh, sorry, so when the, the V8 benchmarks for promises are based on the, uh, Bluebird, the Bluebird benchmark for promises, and we have never run that on anything other than our laptops. And as far as I know, they don't, uh, like V8 doesn't run their benchmarks on different architectures uh, for promises. So maybe. We, I think we mostly run it on like 64 platforms, so in general, we also test on mobile devices. But I'm not sure whether we also do it for this particular performance benchmark. So I, I, I'm going to, that was fun. Yeah, we're rolling it back in. We're rolling it back in. Um, Utopia.PromisePy was like our first major push to try to add promise support to as many APIs as possible. Um, but James did work on FS promises that was you know, a more direct implementation that's specific to those FS APIs that expose promise-based APIs for, I believe, just the asynchronous uh, interfaces, correct? So I believe that was the first one. And then, yeah, we DNS also has been done. I think there's a, I, I won't call it abandoned, but an unloved pull request from me for child process. Um, I think in general, though, it can be, non-trivial, you're touching a non-trivial amount of code to do these refactors and to make these new APIs, but the API surface is defined. There's examples of other APIs that have already been done. And if we at least as a group um, agree that this is something we want done, I think this can be a good way of leveling up new contributors um, by identifying the APIs they can work on. Um, yeah. In, in terms of the, the, the API surface area, a lot of folks have made 
suggestions that you know we take a, an existing function that accepts a callback, and if the callback's not passed, then just return a promise. We cannot do that consistently. Uh, you know, some of those functions already have return values. But if we if, if we change the return value, then it's basically a sem it's a sem uh, major breaking change. The way that we've been doing this is uh, to to make it the introduction of a new of a, of a promise type version to be somewhere minor. So we're not breaking any existing code or any assumptions on the existing API surface. That's why we have fs.promise, all right, or dns.promise as a separate set of functions here. Um, and then the second point, you go back to fs, the reason the, the reason fs was done the way it was is so that we could avoid duplicating code. Uh, most of that of the async activity within FS actually happens down at the native layer, not in the JavaScript layer. Uh, so what we do is we create the promise on the JavaScript side, but we resolve it on the C++ side there without duplicating the code uh, to also do the callback version. So on the JS side, there's, you know, it's a, it's a separate set of functions that are defined there, but under the covers at the at native layer, it's the same code that's running. In either case, uh, DNS was done a slightly different way. So, in, in each one of these transitions, we actually have to look at the, if the specific way that the module and those APIs were implemented. And you know, there's not going to be a single pattern that's going to apply to every module. Just to like understand, like synthesize my learning. I, so I, uh, to be clear, like the the diff and like the reason why you have that difference where in the JavaScript layer where you have multiple implementations, but at the native layer they all utilize the same path is to kind of, for like to preserve the breaking, like to preserve the API. Uh, or preserve the API, eliminate duplication of code. We we do preserve the existing API, eliminate duplication of code, right, and uh, you know build the. <coughs> The less we can duplicate that code, the fewer chance of bugs and differences in behavior, right? So. It also offers like a good opportunity to like abstract out and figure out like, hey, what within this module is like the core functionality versus what is more of the interface. Um, and at least for FS, I think when I was reviewing that code, a lot of kind of what was the core or like underlying plumbing of FS is kind of broken out. And then what's really different is just the interface into that plumbing. Um, but I, I guess at a high level, what I think, and, and maybe we need to identify people and pair them with the APIs, I think that these are really interesting opportunities to give bounded work that's more advanced than like changing a line in the test, which is how we've traditionally been like doing our onboarding through Code and Learns. I would love to see if A, we can make more of a concerted effort for moving these promise APIs forward, but also B, if we could use this as a way to level up newer contributors, create new code owners for parts of our code base, have people be more familiar with parts of our code base. Um, but it will require, you know, a, like some mentorship and some oversight and some support. And I also think just in general, like, I know for myself, when I opened up the child process one, there was like a handful of pushback about like how I should do it and some bike shedding. And honestly, I just didn't have the energy to finish it. And I'm quite familiar with course, so I can imagine someone who is not me also not getting it done. <laughs> um, but I just think if we really want to tackle this, like perhaps we need a working group or perhaps we need a team or perhaps we need more of a concerted effort but we should be like fairly consistent in the way that we approach it and review these things um, and have at the very least maybe some resources and documenting like what do we need to make a promised API so that we aren't like re-litigating what the, what the, bear, what, what like our expectations are every single time one of these APIs com comes in. We should be consistent and all the APIs should be held to the same kind of like bar of expectation and consistency. So I think for child process, for example, one of the things that was blocked is like, what are you going to do with all the sync APIs? Should all the sync APIs also be exposed in the same interface? And I just didn't have time to like go through and litigate all that stuff. But we should just have like 
maybe a how-to guide. You're, so you want to promiseify an API. Here are what the expectations are. And if we have a review and it's not in that guide, like it should get added to that guide or it shouldn't, it shouldn't be necessary. I'll go ahead and get started on that. So um, it's going to take, it's not going to be complete, right? Um, but I get, we can take a first pass based on what we've already done. But, but that guide itself is going to take a few, uh, take some iteration mm -hmm. because there are still some parts of the existing API that we're not quite sure how to be done. And like I said, it's not something that currently we have a clear set of rules that will apply consistently across. We have to figure out what those are. are. Yeah, so I think based on that, we can think of this as like a living document that we iterate on, but at least becomes the set, the source of truth for kind of the history of creating these APIs and what the expectations are. I would volunteer to help work on that. Is there anyone else who would help with creating this document? James, put your hand up. <laughs> <laughs> He, he, he just, he promised to do it, but it resolved late. <laughs> just wanted to make sure you didn't reject. Um, cool. Um, Ruben. Yeah, um, so I'm not sure how much more we, uh, we should look into this. There is still a couple of questions around um, uh, implementing uh, native promise support in the different APIs because uh, our APIs partially look very different. And like, uh, for example, events have very different requirements than like FS. Um, then we have uh, promise support and assert, which have a different name to uh, um, the uh, throw to, to the similar functionality, uh, like assert throws and assert rejects. Yeah. But um, that's different, for example, with, with FS, because we have reach file and we have promises dot read file, which is the same name for the function. So it's not completely clear always, but only looking at the function name, what it is about, if it uses a callback or not. Uh, and these things have to be decided while implementing uh, the promise-based APIs for all the modules that we did not look at so far. So uh, one of the challenges on, there are two challenges on some of those, uh, especially on HTTP and NET. And those are uh, related to how we receive, show new connections. And how, how, because if you, if you're using, a, if you're using a HTTP server or a, a NET, or, you, or you're building a, a protocol on the for over the NAT or TLS, you are essentially putting using event, uh, an event emitter. So we emit a new connection as a new event. Okay, and uh, the hard challenge there is we need to decide which type of API do we want to to provide in a promise way. Like, what does it mean to promiseify to to to, to support promises in a world where we are uh, emitting an uh, uh, we are emitting an event, okay? Like if you are, in a, if when we so HTTP, if you are creating an HTTP server and you do HTTP dot create server and you pass in an handler, okay, which takes request and response, right? That in fact is gets added as an event listener to the request event. Now it means that the core functionality of our HTTP um, of our uh, HTTP server, which is a, that important part of node relies on event emitter. Now, what does it mean to provide us a promise API for that? And this is one of the questions that we still have not answered. There is certain type of discussions and certain type of APIs that are being uh, circulated from, uh, there is, Dino has implemented something on that, on that area. I personally don't like what they've done. I don't think that's a great idea. Uh, but that's my personal take. Yes. Okay. Um, so, yeah, yeah. No, what I was saying is, it's uh, uh, putting down, uh, I going down to, to that path in order to provide the, 
And that is the first one. So we have serve, our servers are event meter. So in order to provide an API uh, promised version for those, we need to figure out what is the pattern for those, okay? And the second one is what do we do with streams? Again, request and response inherits from streams. So what, are we, what does it mean for having a, a, a promised version for these? And in order to do crypto, TLS, and HTTP, and NET, uh, we need to solve those two problems first, to some extent. Uh, rather, because if we don't, then we can, we are out, like, we can promise if I don't listen, okay? But, you know, that's not, that it's an API that gets called once per process, more or less. So it's not really, you know, we're not really providing a better user experience. We're not improving on the day-to-day, -day, okay? So, um, you know, that's, uh, I just wanted to, to say, there is a kind of a blocker for this. If we need to figure out what those means. And if you're interested in figuring those out, let's chat a little bit because I'm available. I've done a PR, but that's, if we have some time at the end, I will just show my PR for every meter. <laughs> the question is more like around your, your, your problem of um, managing like, you know, all, all of these different um, events that have different kind of uh, APIs. Um, so, Matea, it's okay. I have some questions for you. It's okay. Yeah. No, 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 it's for you. So, I'm just curious if like, so I'm, this is my like web application developer brain, right? Um, but like the way I would solve this problem is like having a, like, a, like a like a like an event manager, like essentially for my events. And so that and like all of the details of like um, you know you know you're using queues and stacks and like it's the you know and you're and there's all the implement like the implementation details are inside that class for knowing um, how to deal with you know the different types of um, kind of uh, handshakes, you know? Uh, so I just was curious if something like that would be an option. Uh. So um, I would prefer not to re-implement Eventimeter from scratch. Oh. <laughs> that would be my, uh, that's my answer. So what we need, what I think we need to provide is something that is uh, very similar to what Node does right now, but with some additional functionality. Like uh, uh, event meter and streams are part of our inheritance chain for a lot of things. So essentially, in order to replace those, so we cannot, so the challenge between these and fs.promises, for example, is that, as James said, fs.promises is a full new implementation, okay? With uh, uh, event meter, event meter is as part of our, our, as a, in our hierarchy. So, uh, HTTP server in edit from an intermeter. So, uh, we probably cannot follow the same approach, or we need to think if we want to do to follow a different approach. But that will mean it might need to, you know, implement a significant, significant chunk of node internals. And do we need that? All right. Um, thanks a lot for all these good insights. And uh, I guess we, so here in the issue, there, you will also find a link. I just opened a new issue in, in the Summit repository uh, for the session. And you will find the link, if Joseph, can you think? Yeah, here. There's a link uh, for all the, all the modules in case you want to go in there and make a comment or so and to, and to also find a document again. Um, I would like to continue now with the annual rejection survey because I don't know how many of you would be comfortable of deciding what should be the default in Node Core. Like, would anyone say, like, yeah, they have a strong opinion on what it should look like? Yeah, a couple of hands. Like, <laughs> all right. Uh, like, what of and these people who have a strong opinion, what do you think it should look like? If I may ask. I'll go last. <laughs> well, I don't know who wants to go first. Uh, for, for debugging purposes, for debugging purposes, the strict mode would be beneficial. Like um, ha having a, a default that shows information rather than losing it would be useful. Let's keep it brief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, so like the one thing that I definitely do care about is that I would want the process to exit with a non-zero exit code. Like crash or, or the warning or whatever, but like that should be there. I, think. I want consistency with errors that are not encapsulated within process. And uh, I think you actually have to take the non-engineering approach to this. These are all nice things to want. But really, you've got to look at what node is. You have a lot of customers that use it. And you should actually just think about the reputation more than natural. What's best for engineering with this one feature? Strict may not be the best. It, can you elaborate again? I, I'm not sure it was able to come. <clears throat> OK, so if, if we have an option, a, a strict option, Unless we use it, unless it's used wisely by the users, and you can't always trust users to use things wisely, you could damage your reputation. People might seek it, come alarmed unnecessarily, and that's something you don't want. I'll go, I'll take every step not to alarm anybody because even the talk of the word exiting uh, will throw uh, a lot of people into, into pandemonium. Do you know how it is implemented right now? Do you know how the implementation looks like? Because it does not exit. That is correct. That is correct. It was only in strict mode. Yeah. I thought you just said you wanted to. So it just uh, to give you um, uh, an outline of how the mode exactly works like. So none just suppresses any warnings that are currently locked. At the moment, when you're running into an unheld rejection using Node.js, it would lock multiple things. First of all, it would lock a warning and that you have an unheld rejection. The second, it would first, like for the very first one that is locked, it would also um, tell you this is uh, duplicated and please handle all your rejections. And I believe there is even a third thing, uh, I don't have it in my right handy right now, um, that gives you an additional context a little bit. How, like where the error originated from. So this is the current warning thing. And if you opt into the warning mode, it would still do the regular warning and give you the context where it came from without the duplication warning at the beginning. And the strict mode would not exit with a non-zero exit code by default. What it does instead is when you're running into an unheld rejection, it would then turn that unheld rejection into an uncaught exception, which then has by default of Node.js the behavior of um, exiting the process with a non-zero exit code, because that's the uh, um, process for uncaught exceptions in general. Um, that's that's just the case. And so the you could still stop that by having an uncaught exception hook, which um, would mean that the process could continue lock stuff or whatever that the user would wish to have the default. So that's how it works, and um, I hope that clears it up. Okay, great. So thank you very much for the feedback. Oh, right, I missed someone. Um, so I pretty much agree with everyone that we should do the same thing we do for regular errors, and there's, I would prefer if they would do the same thing uh, on uncaught exceptions and on uncaught exceptions in async functions. Uh, and it's, I just want to echo that it's something that they hear a lot of complaints about, uh, that we don't do it. Uh, so um, I think uh, there is a lot of uh, new developers coming to Node, people that don't know uh, how JavaScript works and don't know how promises work. And they're just focused on shipping business features. And you know they're not, maybe not even interested in learning more about the internals of the language and internals of the runtime. And uh, I think whichever default we choose needs to take into consideration the fact that we should try to make the most sensible things to avoid them huge problems in production, which is, you know, um, uh, hmm? brief, yes. I would have finished. <laughs> so uh, essentially make things as, as, uh, as safe in production as possible by default. Um, and the reason is, again, there's a lot of, you know, mixed mixed problems in, in the wild on asking functions and promises and event emitters and callbacks. So 
yeah, that's it. And uh, yeah, I mean, something that is safe for people. And I personally think that that is, you know, exiting. But that's my uh, uh, my current. Uh, that's my take. Uh, but there are other things that we can do to mitigate those problems and avoid those problems. So we might even, you know, um, do something slightly different. So essentially, uh, there are other options. Okay. So I hope it's like from from hearing all these different opinions. I hope it's fair to uh, give like a outline of what my feeling is, uh, and that this room would mainly wish as a default and that sounds like it, it would be the strict mode probably does someone strongly disagree with that i don't see any hands cool i think that's actually a pretty nice outcome just to for uh, our uh, um as, as a recommendation if we could uh, in the outline there's a lot of people that are not here yeah yeah definitely there are a lot of people that are not here and i don't want to decide anything in here just to just to make it clear Mathieu, there's nothing to decide here today all right <laughs> um and so what uh, i do want to or i wish at least is i ask every single one of you to open up this issue and to go to the document that is linked there linked to the survey questions because what I actually think is best to do is to make a survey and to um, work on that very well. Um, like when we gathered enough question that should hopefully like, please try to be very unbiased, uh, outline pros and cons for uh, um, different things, give examples, all these things could be gathered in that document. And um, then I'm going to go to the diagnostic working group with that again where iterating over it, making the final questions, giving that to the survey working group, which we do have as well, and then to send out that as a survey. And if that results in a clear opinion, I think it's significantly easier to follow up on whatever our users think is best or not. Even though we personally already have an opinion in what direction it should hopefully go. Right. Um, is there anything else on this topic? Otherwise, I would continue. Does anyone want to add something? No. Good. I um, does anyone disagree with that? Like with my suggestion? No. Okay. Well, I hope you think it's a good idea. Um, let's go to the unheld, uh, no, no, to the multiple results hook. So this is a bit tricky because at the moment there is not really a good use case because of the false and positives in a way. Um, Yang, that's a personal question to, to Google. Do you think you could work on that to improve um, the output so we can actually tell our users more about it? Um, we can definitely accept patches. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not going to be too hard. Yeah. So if we have some like pre cycles, we can smooth it over and get it done. I'm not sure. We have planning coming up, so maybe we can uh, prioritize this. Thing. Okay, cool. Um, anyone to add something to the topic? Because I, I guess there is like we are pretty much blocked on Google. <laughs> or on anyone opening a PR on that. So it's like everyone who knows C well and wants to work a little bit on V8. Right. So to be fair, multiple results is a hook V8 added for us after we asked for it in the last call up summit. And uh, we didn't specify it well enough, and this is my fault. Uh, and we didn't think about all those edge cases. And I think the big challenge in multiple results right now isn't the C side. I don't mind even like uh, I, I probably won't go through the V8 process, but I don't mind writing the code and have someone from V8 go through the process. I think it's mostly blocked on deciding uh, what we want from the hook and uh, specifying the edge cases. So if someone can write tests, uh, failing tests for what multiple results should do in all these cases, uh, that would be that like that's what we are stuck on right now. 
Yeah, I think that's a cool idea. Would anyone be up for that? No? Too bad. Huh. <laughs> All right, let's, let's hope we can move forward with that topic soon, um, because I personally believe we should try to have the best debugging experience for our users when it comes to promises that is possible, and that would be part of it, and because and they might run into issues that they are not aware of, because the promise constructor is pretty much a dead zone. You don't know what happens there if a promise is already settled because it cannot change the state afterwards anymore, even though it might be sold again or reject afterwards, something like that. Um, it, actually, after talking about this, Walla, well, uh, do you do know uh, about the problem itself? Or uh, who does not understand the problem with multiple resources? I don't, I'm not sorry to say. So, um, at the moment, the promise constructor, uh, when uh, it, when there is a synchronous error in a promise constructor, it would be rejected, right? And that's good. Um, and if you call either the reject or the resolve function, it would be settled. Like as soon as you have it rejected or resolved, it's called settled. And, and then it is in a new state and it cannot change that state afterwards anymore. It will always stay rejected or resolved. But the problem with that is that the promise constructor it does not prevent any further code to be executed in that constructor, even though it is already settled. Now, if there is a second error or a second resolve, something like that in there, it will still be executed. And it could cause side effects and errors that you don't understand in the output because you don't see them, because it's just silent pretty much. It's, it's a dead zone from the code. Like, can you open a code editor? Oh, uh, yeah. But I just want to show that. Um, I'm a little bit confused. So, promises are immutable. Like, that's like the best part about them, right? Like, once they're resolved or rejected, that's it. So, uh, why, is, why is this even an issue? It's basically like code after the return statement. Like, you know, or is this like. No, no, no. It, it's not about the return statement. Yeah, sorry. So Benjamin is going to show a nice example. It's only about the constructor, the promise constructor, a new promise, and then you have the function that receives up to two arguments, which is the resolve and the reject function, that you can then call in the promise constructor to settle it. But you can call this function or both functions multiple times, which would cause the promise not to change the state the second time you call it, and it would also not take the new value. Uh, even like, let's say you resolve twice with different values, it would only take the first value that it received, and it would not know anything about the second resolve anymore. So, if the first so if we resolve with some value and then we call some function or do some cleanup, and it's a very nasty bug, I've seen it in some uh, big code bases of companies, uh, then this second, like the promise constructor is, is built uh, using this pattern called the revealing constructor pattern, where it takes the function and it executes it synchronously and it converts uh, and thrown exceptions to rejections. That second line, that some function call, if that throws, that exception gets swallowed and like no one knows about it. And the multiple results gives you a hook that uh, gives you access to that second uh, exception. And the, like the bug I've seen is where that uh, function call was clean up this resource. Uh, they had a typo in production. Uh, clean up this resource, did it execute, they did it, and like no one saw the errors. So this is why it's uh, something uh, that we want to address. So a um, practical example of this, uh, just fairly recently, another one was uh, when, uh, in the FSA uh, API, you have to open a lot of scripture. You have to manually close it, right? Um, and in the cleanup logic, uh, the, 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 the file scripture was not being closed. And so we're making uh, file scripts um, specifically because of this. 
Um, it's interesting to note that there was just recently on Twitter, uh, uh, folks were debating with me about whether multiple resolves should be allowed. And the argument was is that we should we shouldn't do anything here just let them resolve multiple times and the argument literally was that resource weeks can't happen with promises and like you know there is this perception out there with people that are using this if you use the api in a certain way that this stuff cannot happen but practically speaking i mean you know in real world these things are happening uh and specifically even though because of things like the script here. Yeah, thank you very much for having that as well. I hope that uh, answers the questions. Yeah, thank you very much, all of you shows. Yeah. The visuals were really helpful too. Uh, that's awesome. So, does, is this a problem that only occurs in the process structure? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because that makes it actually easy to code directly. Oh. Yeah, but no. So, um, the problem is that promise and dot all and promise dot raise and promise um, all samples. I'm not 100% sure about all several because it's still very new, but it is, uh, as far as I know, it used the promise constructor all underneath. Yeah. And because of that, uh -huh. so uh, we are uh, receiving the uh, multiple resolves notifications from promise rate, which is super bad because it's actually meant to resolve more than once. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's something like this. It does like promise array, dot for each. Uh, that's like a note. I mean, like when you install the promise computer, uh, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, I'm stuck on my computer. Oh, it works again. Uh, <laughs> promise array. Yeah, but if I'm not mistaken, at least in the in the VAT implementation, for promise all is different than the uh, promise constructor itself. So uh, I think we should be able to detect from the This is great. Right? Right, yeah. But I, I think from from the way it's implemented, we should be able to figure it out. Please um, do. It seems like it could be hard to implement that in a reliable way. Maybe you can implement it to work sometimes, but because it's so dynamic with calling the bin method, like if you patch bin to be a function which like does something else and then calls the original bin. You might not like notice that it was originally coming. So anyway, in, at a higher level, uh, exposing more debug information to people sounds great. And I don't think we're going to change these things in the JavaScript standard. There's a lot of things about promises that I personally find very regrettable. And I think you identified like other things that I wouldn't have thought of as like, you know, there, there's many dimensions of, of interesting design choices here. And uh, at the same time, they're shipped very widely, they're very widely used, and I don't think the, the standards are going to change. So to the extent that Node is, uh, you know, clarifying these things, I hope, I hope it can be really restricted towards making like a, a strict subset of behavior and like making warnings or maybe crashing everybody or something like that and not going and adopting different semantics, even as tempting as it can be. So this is something that Ruben and I have talked about offline, where he said, like, isn't this case bad? Like, yes, and uh, and I don't think we should change it, because there's so much use of promises, it's just not not the time to change it. Going forward with DC39, I want to like, be more open in consulting. I mean, I know that promises were designed in this open way, and then there was this sort of Something happened and they became the standard and they had all these weird things. Like so, just for some historical context, like the promise constructor, the, its behavior, we used to think it's a good idea. So it's not like we didn't think about this case that what we had in mind is if you're preparing an API to promises, uh, then you have to handle both uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, errors. And the way the promise constructor works is that it normalizes that. It, you, you will only get asynchronous errors. And like the, the thing about multiple results, we used to think it's a feature because we did never consider this case. So it's not like the fact like the fact you can resolve uh, multiple times and it will only work the first one is intentional. And that actually takes back to some of the e-language stuff. Uh, and it's not like it, it's it's positive. 
the fact that it leaks five scripters uh, because you can throw an error after your result is not intentional because this is not the API you started with. The original API was deferred. We need a promise of defer. That's the first API that prompts it. And this API was supposed to be safer. And I, I think that if we would have done that, we would not have shipped this. Well, yeah. I was involved in unchipping promise that defer for what it's worth. So anyway. Uh, stuff happened, there were rationales, lots of rationales about every single little case. And we ended up where we are. And uh, at this point, I hope that Node can remain compatible with the broader ecosystem. And with any variation, just, just maybe create errors and help developers with that, but not change anything. Uh, absolutely. We agree we, we on that. Like, there is no... Uh, point where we want to change semantics specifically for Node.js. It's only providing extra uh, information that's errors. Like a, that, that sounds great. That sounds really good. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, right. so I'm super into ASTs and um, I actually just talked to Mattia and I were like bike shedding on something and we're going to collaborate on a project where like he's basically just going to give me his list of problems and I'm going to use my like AST knowledge to build a, a linting tools uh, on async anti patterns. Um, so I'm really excited about this. I think I'm going to file an issue in the summit so you guys can follow along. Um, but uh, I'm curious if there's just a pot, like, I think there's like a, uh, like the advocacy piece for this could be like creating of like a linter, like linting rules around like do not do this. Um, because like, for me, like I'm just, there's a major separation of concerns that I'm seeing here. Like, I'm like the platform like shouldn't have to like write a bunch of code to like Stop developers from shooting themselves in the foot because the spec was bad. You know, like the real fix should be fix the spec, but I like for I guess for whatever reason that's not possible. I'm not sure why, but I, I don't want to get into it. Um, so <laughs> you know, I just but you know, like, I'm just curious. Like, would you guys think that would be useful to like have a like like lit, like linting plugins that we like are like a oh, set of like widely recommended lint, linting rules for Node, um, just to like say hey community, like there's you know stuff you can do that's gonna like hurt you. And we really recommend you, you know, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should, and yeah, so forth. So I mean, that's just a way to kind of programmatically, um, like, like nip it in the butt. Just uh, very briefly, we don't have a lot of time anymore. There's still a little bit uh, something else that I would also like to discuss, though. Um, and uh, we like uh, historically, um, I think uh, one year ago, we've spoken about this. Uh, actually, yeah, Berlin, right? About the ESLint rules. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so there is a linter that does like uh, uh, promise lint validations. There is an ESLint plugin, and that works. Uh, it's not able to catch all the cases. Like in, in Bluebird, we have warnings uh, for uh, stuff that's not analyzable statically. Like you get a parameter name, you don't know the type. The type might be a promise. And then, uh, or, or for example, one of the biggest issues people have is that they create promises in then and there's, they don't return them. And then it doesn't wait for the for the then. Uh, I feel like 80% or 85% of these cases can be caught statically, and then there's like 15 that are uh, that can't. But the problem is that the 15 are the hardest bugs uh, to debug. Uh, and I actually know some good people uh, that would love to collaborate with you on the, like I'd love to help, but I know some people who are better at ASD stuff than me that would love to help. I mean, it, this about documentation and tooling all seems really great, and we should simultaneously acknowledge that it's going to be, if we, if we work in this direction, it's going to be opinionated and not have the consensus with the whole world. Ultimately, these things are all uh, political in some way, whether you're documenting how the world works or how the world should work, and we should be comfortable entering into that space if we, we want to work on it. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think it's a great idea. I'm looking forward to uh, using those rules. Um, then, so lock unresolved promises on exit. Uh, would, would you be so kind and also give me an example for that? That's <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Thanks a lot. <laughs> and uh, so, so the problem there is, as I said before, on the Node.js issue tracker, people relatively frequently come in and have say like, hey, uh, my program ended, but my promise never resolved, and it, my program should not end before my promise resolved. 
Well, it normally only resolves if there is nothing else going on in the program anymore. Because then the event loop is empty and, and Node.js cannot detect anything anymore. A promise is nothing that keeps the event loop alive. So uh, as soon as it would resolve, uh, and then there would be some work again for Node.js and the process would be kept alive. But obviously, the promise never resolves, so there's a bug in the program. And because in the, the branch, which should normally result in the promise to resolve, was not reached. And, and this is confusing for our users. And uh, it would be great to actually notify everyone about it. So I've spoken to Young. We are uh, on exit, able to iterate over the heap, which means, which means we are able to uh, detect what um, the objects are there. Uh, still alive, and then we check: is it actually a promise? If it is a promise and it is unresolved, oh, sorry, unsettled, um, then we could uh, actually uh, tell the user where this promise uh, is currently at in the code, and say, hey, this does not resolve. Please have a look at that. That seems like a bug. Is that something everyone agrees upon uh, to implement? This I, I think for the very least we should have a okay. I think uh, this is also like why isn't my code running? Like so it, it's it's frustrating to debug errors. It's even more frustrating, at least for me, to debug code where code doesn't run and I don't understand why. And unresolved, uh, like unsettled promises uh, can be really frustrating to debug uh, for some users, me included. I think for the very least we should expose this somehow, even if we don't want to log uh, log this by default, because there are cases where you will have uh, programs ending with, with unsettled promises, we should at least have some way to uh, monitor this or, uh, or device. So my suggestion about it is to implement it similar to the current unhandled rejections flag, to have it there, and then we can, again, at another summit, uh, discuss if we want to have that as a default log. I think what Benjamin is, is the exact thing just put up there is you know, it, being able to enable it optionally is, it, I think it needs to be opt in specifically for command line flag where you can say, you know, I want, I want to accomplish these things. There's just going to be too many cases where we're we want, when we exit, we want to exit immediately without doing any kind of iteration. So enabling other people to get the month starter, having it there as an opt in is the way to go. Um, so this my my original proposal for doing um, various different things with um, promises on exit um, also included this, um, and I mean I feel that it could probably be added to the, like the the selection of unhandled uh, rejection default warnings already, um, like default options, um, like in the default case. We could go along with how the other setting is um, set for um, the unhandled rejection event. And so the default case right now would be to warn, which uh, they would get anyways, otherwise, which probably wouldn't be that disruptive. Um, and then you could, if, if we changed that in some future version as well, it could change along with it. Okay, so that's um, so you're saying actually you would want to have it aligned with the current unhandled rejections flag. So if that is used and someone would opt into either warn or the strict mode, you would want to log those as well. Did I summarize that correct? Yes. Although not thinking about it again, I might be thinking about it wrong because this was paired with. A proposal that you choose to stop. So why am I even that? But I would I would like the, the, the behavior to sort of be aligned with all of all of that together. Okay. I guess we could have different um guards or different possibilities. What I, 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 sorry. 
I might be misremembering, but I think in your PR, Jeremiah, uh, the promises, uh, like it, it I'm sorry? Uh, so I, I think in your PR, it's a log, the like promises that were rejected and not just pending, but they might be like misremembering. Because I, I think what you did is like, on, when the process exits, like log all the promises that are rejected and not. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. oh yeah, okay. Because I, I think there are use cases that like, Especially in, uh, not, not, not so much in servers, but in the command line tools, you have uh, like an unset of promises uh, sometimes uh, in the code when the process exits. Like people will just put process of exit in random places uh, in CLI tools. And we could actually also, and like, that's, that's a very valid point as well. So one question is, should we mm, then Warm in case someone called process exit. What do you think? Yeah, I mean like process exit. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think process exit is just like a very explicit way to actually intentionally uh, clear all the state that is existing in the process. And so I don't think that should trigger anything. Yeah, I think that's a good point. All right, I believe we are through. The time is also over. Um, thank you very much. And I guess we can continue with the next topic.